pastors, and lay preachers would tell you that God is full of glory, and humans need to be filled with the glory of God. And as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of God. And then he because he is glorious from the time of his existence, which has been forever. Don't think about that too long, you're gonna jump out a window. God is so glorious that he does not have to go outside of himself to make himself better at what himself is. God. You know, God is so good. He wants to manifest his power. He wants to manifest his love. He wants to manifest his glory. You know, they would have you believe that God is love. God is full of love. Kind of love. God is seen as the foundation, the fountain, the source of all true love. Right, well, you're right. John writes in 1 John, God is love. They say that because God is filled with grace, He offers us that grace. Standard. But because He loves us, He sent His Son Jesus, and then He offers us His grace. God is the instigator of grace, and it is from Him that all grace flows. So if one does follow their advice and is filled with God, what is one really full of? What is God full of? Let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Today, rather than looking at one video or one preacher, I wanted to discuss one Christian idea. Christians will tell us that the Bible says believers are all Vessels for the glory of God. Side note here. As I was looking up the verses to go in this section, when I googled vessels of glory, this was the first thing that popped up. Also this. Back to the Bible for the claim that humans are the vessels for God's glory. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Romans 9, 23 to 24. So the believer is supposed to be a vessel for the glory and mercy of God. But the believer is the minority of humans, no matter how you look at it. Pew Research puts Christians at about 30% of the world population. But most Christians put the percentage much lower as they point fingers at each other, saying that other groups aren't real Christians. Many Protestants say that Catholics aren't Christians. Some groups say that Jehovah's Witnesses aren't, or Seventh-day Adventists, and so on. Westboro Baptist Church, because of the horrid things that they do, are called unbelievers even by other Baptists. You know, you get all those like Westboro Baptist Church, you know, those Calvinist freaks out there in the Midwest that'll protest military funerals and all of these other things. Now, folks, I'm not about licking the boots of the military, but folks, these people are, are, are deceived, many of them, and they go and they... Who accepts who as being a believer and who is so far off as to be considered an unbeliever varies so much from denomination to denomination that I have yet to find a believer that can say what percent of the population are real believers. Since Pew Research has the broadest definition, we'll go with that one. God's glory will fit into about one-third of the humans. If God was really filled with glory and humans were to be the vessels of that glory, wouldn't you expect there to be more believers than unbelievers? If believers are vessels of God's glory, what are unbelievers? To find that answer, according to the Bible, we need only back up one verse from the verse about believers being vessels of God's glory. Romans 9.22 What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? 
I chose this image because it includes Matthew Henry's commentary on the meaning of the verse. Matthew Henry's commentary was written 300 years ago, but it is still considered one of the best commentaries on the New Testament. Matthew Henry interprets, Whatever God does must be just. Why? If you assume that God is just, you will find a way to make it look like God is just, which is exactly what all the commentaries and apologists try to do, because the Bible says God is just. So when he isn't, we have to make the Bible in agreement, so we just find a way to make him appear just. Wherein the holy, happy people of God differ from others, God's grace alone makes them differ. In this, preventing effectual distinguishing grace, he acts as a benefactor whose grace is his own. None deserved it, so that those who are saved must thank God only, and those who perish must blame only themselves. For what? For not being chosen? If God's grace is a gift from God whose grace is his own, why do I need to blame myself if God chooses to withhold it from me? Who had the choice in this deal? It wasn't me. So most people were created or prepared for destruction as vessels of God's wrath. Now what does this tell us about God? If he needs a few vessels for his glory, but billions of vessels for his wrath, does that not mean that he has a little bit of glory and a whole lot of wrath? Next, what does God do with all these vessels? Well, the Bible tells us that the vessels of glory go to heaven to be with God. John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would not have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you also will be. And Revelation 20, 11 through 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It doesn't specify these as vessels of glory and vessels of wrath but the meaning is sufficiently clear that most Christians agree that this is who is meant by these. So the vessels of wrath are thrown into the lake of fire if their names aren't written in the book of life. But do not despair, my fellow vessels of wrath. Granny has your back. I hacked the book of life and added everyone. See? If you think I'm lying, prove me wrong. I dare you. Now, the Romans passage said the vessels were chosen by God beforehand to be what they are. In contrast, Timothy says, Now, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So according to this verse, if you are a vessel of wrath or dishonor, you could make yourself into a vessel of honor or glory by cleansing yourself. You know, this brings into question a whole passage on the potter and the clay. If the potter made you to be a vessel of wrath, if the potter made you as a vessel of dishonor, how can the pot then remake itself into being a vessel of honor? It's just one more contradiction in the Bible. This one has had the Calvinists and Arminians arguing with each other for centuries. Regardless of whether vessels of wrath can change their situation, the vessels of wrath are thrown away. What this means to be thrown away 
also varies greatly on which version of Christianity the person you are talking to adheres to, or which Bible passage you are looking at. Some say the vessels of wrath simply cease to exist. They are annihilated. Some say that they burn in hell forever. Some say that they are separated from God, but that that separation is the only thing that they suffer. The Jewish tradition is that the Old Testament's afterlife was the same for all. According to the website My Jewish Learning, there are, however, several biblical references to a place called Sheol. It is described as a region dark and deep, the pit, and the land of forgetfulness, where human beings descend after death. The suggestion is that in the netherworld of Sheol, the deceased, although cut off from God and humankind, live on in some shadowy state of existence. While this vision of Sheol is rather bleak, setting precedence for later Jewish and Christian ideas of an underground hell, there is generally no concept of judgment or reward and punishment attached to it. In fact, the more pessimistic books of the Bible, such as Ecclesiastes and Job, insist that all of the dead go down to Sheol, whether good or evil, rich or poor, slave or free man. Regardless of which version you go with, God doesn't want these vessels. These are filled with the parts of God that he doesn't want. His garbage. Then God throws out the vessel with the garbage. The garbage that God filled the vessel with. So if God needs a few vessels for his glory, but the vast majority of vessels to fill with his garbage, what is God really full of? about love? Is God full of love? Let's examine that claim. God is love. When I talk about the bad side of God, that he kills the innocent, condones slavery, condones genocide, and considers women as property, I have believers remind me that God is love. Not just that God is filled with love, but that God is love. God is the source of all love that humans would be incapable of love were it not for God. Some tell me that this is different. This was the God of the Old Testament when the world was under the law. Hmm, like in Deuteronomy chapter 28? Let's take a look at the love God has for his followers, shall we? If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but will flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Skipping a few redundant verses. Do not turn aside from the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Isn't this a nice God? So long as you pay no attention to all the other gods, he will bless you. And now... Now, the rest of the story. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commandments and decrees, I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. And the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and lambs of your flocks. 
You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done in forsaking him. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron. The Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven. And you will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the wild animals, and there will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors, festering sores, and the itch from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. At midday you will grope about like a blind person in the dark. You will be unsuccessful in everything you do. Day after day you will be oppressed and robbed with no one to rescue you. You will be pledged to be married to a woman, but another will take her and rape her. Okay, this is just too much. If you don't obey God, he will arrange for your fiancé to be raped. How is this justice? Can you imagine being convicted of a crime and your punishment is that your fiancé will be raped? Talk about cruel and unusual punishment. If this is what God's idea is of being perfect and of being holy, count me out. But he's not done. There are more curses. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will not even begin to enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will eat none of it. Your donkey will be forcibly taken from you and will not be returned. Your sheep will be given to your enemies, and no one will rescue them. Your sons and daughters will be given to another nation, and you will wear out your eyes watching for them day after day, powerless to lift a hand. Once again, punishing the innocent for the crimes of the guilty. No wonder they think substitutionary atonement is a good idea. A people that you do not know will eat what your land and labor produce, and you will have nothing but cruel oppression all your days. The sights you see will drive you mad. The Lord will afflict your knees and legs with painful boils that cannot be cured, spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. God allowed Satan to do this to Job, too, even though Job had done nothing wrong. It was a bet that God had with Satan about whether Satan could get Job to curse him. If God really was omniscient, and Satan knew this, wouldn't this be a pretty stupid thing to do as God would already have seen the outcome? This clearly shows that the idea of God being timeless had not been part of the story yet. Or Satan didn't know as much as we do today about God. God obviously evolves over time. I'm skipping the rest of the curses for brevity's sake. But overall, the list of curses is 42 verses. There are only 10 verses of blessings. So I ask you again, what is God really full of? It isn't love and blessings. But the God of the New Testament doesn't do these things because the world is now under grace. Okay, but isn't God supposed to be the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he was a dick under the law, wouldn't he still be a dick under grace? If he had no regard for women under the law, how does being under grace change that? If he condoned immoral acts in the name of enforcing the law, would that not mean that he would condone equally immoral acts under grace? And that is what we find. God still has little regard for women in the New Testament, despite the few places where women are mentioned favorably. They're mentioned favorably in a few places in the Old Testament as well. 
God still condones slavery in the New Testament. He just goes a little further in saying, be nice to your slaves. He still is embarrassingly into the sex lives of humans, still saying that homosexuality is wrong, despite supposedly being the one that created the same-sex attraction desires in the first place. And, of course, the God of the New Testament is still into bloody, gory death threats for anyone who doesn't love and obey him. But he loves you. He has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> this is the emotional appeal that Christians go to, trying to convince would-be followers that love is available to all those that believe. In one sense, they are right. If you believe that there is a God that loves you, then it is possible to convince yourself that you are feeling the love of God. As a believer, I did attribute good feelings to God sending his love. The fact that I had no evidence that these feelings came from anywhere but inside of me was something I never even considered. I have had discussions with believers who are convinced that the source of all love is God. Humans would be incapable of love were it not for God giving you this ability. That they could never back this claim with anything didn't deter them in the least. I think the point to make is that no loving parent would be so offended by their own child that they could condemn them. Last night, I had a graphic dream that illustrates this point well. Trigger warning. I will describe this dream in detail, which may be unsettling to some viewers. If you want to skip the description, jump ahead to the timestamp below. I dreamed that there was an execution being televised. It was a woman who had been sentenced to being burned to death. I didn't know the woman, nor did I have any idea of what crime she was convicted. She was on a bed, wrapped in a mattress that was tied around most of her body. They set fire to the mattress. As she started to burn, she started screaming. I left the room, but even from the next room, I could still hear her screams. This woman was a stranger to me. I knew that she was convicted of a crime and had been sentenced to death, though I didn't know what the crime was. I had no feelings for this woman other than those of a fellow human being. Yet even with only this level of empathy, I could not stand to hear her anguish. If a God is supposed to be a God of love, a God who cares so deeply for you that he would die for you, how could he possibly not be moved by the anguish of the damned? The true irony of the gospel is that a God that claims to love you so much that he would die for you also tells you that he will murder you if you don't believe that. If you believe in a God that can damn people for eternity, you don't believe in a loving God. What, then, is your God really full of? It sure as hell isn't glory, grace, or love. Live your life.